Today we are looking at one of my new favorite cameras, the DJI Osmo Pocket 3. This camera has tons of features and today we are covering it all so that you can have a deeper understanding of how to leverage it to your advantage and create awesome content. Now this will be a little bit of a longer video, but for your convenience, I've went ahead and made some chapter markers down below so that you can easily find what it is that you're looking for. To kick things off, let's talk about all of the items that it comes with. So for starters, we have the gimbal itself and it's within this little carrying case. This is used to protect the gimbal and it kind of keeps it safe from impact. To remove it, simply slide it out of the case and boom, you've got the camera. Now let's talk about the camera for a second. To actually turn on the camera, all you have to do is slide the screen up like this and the camera will power on, which is pretty cool. The camera features a joystick as well as a record button. The joystick is used to control the movement of the gimbal and can also be used to zoom and it has a few extra commands. If you double tap the gimbal, it will recenter the gimbal, and if you triple tap the joystick, it will actually rotate it around. Then you also have this little record button, and if the camera is off, you can actually hold down that record button, and it will power on the camera as well. And again, you can hold down the record button to turn the gimbal off. Right over here on the side is the micro SD card slot, so you can simply add and remove your micro SD cards there. And then along the bottom is where you can charge the gimbal or attach one of the additional accessories that we'll talk about here in a second. Now, one of the cool things about the case is that it actually includes a little wide angle lens adapter that's hidden inside this compartment. And it actually has an extra compartment here in case you have a different filter like the Black Pro Mist, which is not included. But the cool thing about this little wide angle lens adapter is it simply just attaches directly to the lens magnetically. I really like how compact it is to store everything. When you're done, it can simply fold back into there. But let's keep talking about some of these extra pieces. Next up, we have this little tripod plate attachment piece, and this connects just by plugging right in here. Now, you can't just pull it off. To remove it, you actually need to push this little release button, and then you can release it. But this is really handy because when it's plugged in, you now have a little quarter inch on the bottom to attach this to a tripod or other things like this next little extra piece, these tripod legs. So now I can simply screw this on to this attachment. And I have nice little legs that can let the gimbal stand up on its own. And to remove this again, I can simply push that button and release it. And I've got this nice little leg setup, which is actually how I leave this in my little bag. That way I can quickly have a little base plate to allow the tripod legs to do their work and let the gimbal stand on its own. Next up is another similar piece. It's got a quarter inch on the bottom and it attaches the same way, but the difference is this is actually a battery grip. So having this on will actually extend the camera's battery life. And this is indicated right here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the cool thing about this is it still has a tripod base plate. And I find this extremely useful because most of the time, if I'm going to be needing the battery grip, it's probably because I'm doing longer recordings, in which case I would pretty much have this on a tripod. So I'll actually grab one of my little base plates and I'll connect it here. And I'll just leave that connected most of the time in my bag. So I quickly have a tripod plate attachment ready to go. And last but not least, we have our audio transmitter. This comes with the creator combo and is a really awesome feature of this little setup. All you have to do to connect this is simply hold down the power button. It will light up and then boom, it is connected. And there's a nice little volume icon up here at the top so that you can easily see that it's connected. I'll go over some more of these audio settings in a little bit, but that's pretty much how you get it hooked up and connected right away. 
One of the things I really like about this transmitter is that it's really small and lightweight, so it's easy to bring with you. And it has this little wind muff attachment. You can simply pull that off. It's got this little hole right here and a little stem right here. So you just line it up, push it in, and you're good to go with the wind muff. It's got a little clip right here to put it on a collar or a shirt or anything really, pocket. And then it also has this little magnet here, which is really handy because you can place that between a shirt to get it really flush and not even need something like a collar. There's a little record button right here, a little USB-C plug right here, and you can hit this to link it up. Now the audio device itself can actually record files onto it directly as backups, which is one of the reasons why I really enjoy it. So when it's on, all you have to do is push this little record button, you'll get a little red light right there, and the audio device is actually recording independently of the camera. So even right now, while this is recording, I'm getting audio files directly onto here, even though the camera is off. To get these files off of the device, you can use a USB-C cable and attach it to the computer, and it will act just like a thumb drive. But now that we've talked through a few of these items, let's dive into the actual menu itself. So let's start by talking about these different icons and what they mean. Right up here in this first corner is information about your SD card and really how much time is remaining on the card. Then right over here, this icon with the rectangle and the dotted line is indicating if you're in landscape, portrait, or auto rotation mode. When you're in landscape, that line is going to be shown this way, but if you change it, in portrait mode, it's going to have a different angle. And when you're in auto rotation, there will be no icon. Right next to this is the battery icon. If you push this, you'll actually see some information. You'll see how much battery percentage the Osmo has, as well as a battery grip if connected. Right below this, you have a little indicator of your exposure compensation. Right now I have mine set to negative 0.3 and that's indicated there. Then you have this little oval icon. This is going to relate to the joystick. When you push the joystick up and down, it will be moving the camera up and down. But if you select this little oval and it changes, now it's going to be doing a zoom when you go up and down. So that's a quick way to be able to zoom in and out with the Osmo. Also, if you touch this oval icon, you'll be able to slide up and down to either move the gimbal or zoom the camera. And right down here, you have this little icon to actually flip the Osmo around. So when you press it, the camera will rotate into selfie view. And if you push it again, it will rotate back. Then you have some information about your video frame rate and resolution, depending on which shooting mode you are in. But for most of the modes, this will be your video frame rate and resolution or just your image quality in general. And you can actually swipe up here to change this you know, settings quickly if you wanna to move to 1080, up to 4K, and then you have some different frame rate options here as well that you can choose. Then down in the corner is your video icon, and this is actually your mode selector. So if you touch that icon, it will take you to a screen where you can choose different shooting modes, and that's how you can quickly change that around. Then this last icon right over here is actually some controls for the gimbal. If you go ahead and press that, you'll have three modes. You can do face auto detect, which is basically going to be following the face uh, and placing it at the center of the camera. Then you have this dynamic framing mode, which is nice. If you start this, you can select where you want the subject to be held within the frame and the gimbal will work on keeping the subject in that portion of the frame. And then there's spin shot. This is how you can do those cool little twisty shots. You can choose 90 or 180 degree spins. Once you choose your angle, the camera will point up. Then you can hold it out and kind of move forward or backwards with it and you can simply press this circle icon to start the rotation. To exit this, you can simply slide back, and now you're back to the main screen. So as we saw earlier with the video frame rate and resolution when you swiped up to be able to change that, there's a few other swipeable uh, portions of the menu. So let's go ahead and swipe down, and this is going to give us quite a few system settings. So. This very first icon up here, the, the person, this is how you get into your custom modes. 
So you, you can basically set your video settings and all of your settings the way you want to, and then you can save up to five different custom modes. And I'll show you guys how to do that in just a little bit. The second icon is about screen rotation and capture. So if you toggle this on, when you power on the device by flipping the screen, it will start recording automatically without you having to do anything else. This can be handy if you're in a very live type of situation and you just wanna capture as much as possible. Possible. Just below this, you can choose which mode you want it to engage when you power on the device. You can choose from one of your custom modes. You can choose the last setting, video, low light, or hyperlapse. Personally, I like to leave this on last setting as most of the time, you know, when I turn the camera back on, I kind of want it just to be on what I was using previously. This third icon is for screen brightness. So right now I have it set to 70%. I would say most of the time, you can probably leave it at about 50%. It's plenty bright for most situations. If it's really bright outside, you can go all the way up to 100. Uh, but for the purposes of this video recording, I have it set to 70%. Most of the time though, I leave it on 50. The next setting is face tracking. So if you toggle this on, the gimbal will start automatically looking for and detecting a face if it's in the frame, and the gimbal will follow that around. Now this next icon down here is all about a bunch of different system settings. There's a lot packed into this little icon. First up is wireless mic. This is where if you have a wireless microphone, you can power it on and see it connect. Once you have a transmitter connected, you can access some of these other options like your monitor volume, as well as, you know, if you want to turn the LED indicators on the transmitter on or off, you can do that simply by toggling this on or off. Uh, this vibration will turn off your haptic feedback. I really like to leave vibration on so that when I hit record or I stop recording, it gives me a little buzz that I can feel. Um, audio to video sync, this is where you can turn that on. Uh, you have a low cut filter, which will, you know, be really handy if you're in a very noisy, uh, you know, environment, think maybe by a road or something like that, you might want to engage that. Personally though, I, I leave it off because I like to have full control over that in post-production. Then we have 32-bit float recording. For a simple analogy, you could think of it as like a raw photo instead of a JPEG. It's kind of like a raw audio recording that just retains more information. Uh, you can also format the transmitter if you have a lot of recordings on there. As you can see right now, I've got some and I could choose to format this if I want to. Um, but yeah, all in all, this is pretty much all of your transmitter settings uh, that you can get to in the system right here. All right, next up on the list is the gimbal startup direction. So when you turn the camera on, you can choose if you wanna force it to be forward, backward, or the last setting. I don't really have one that I am set on, so I just like to leave it on the last one. Then there's the rotate screen to power off. This is a very important setting if you're somebody who's going to be wanting to capture vertical. So by default, if I hit now, then as soon as I rotate this screen, the camera will power off. And I do like how fast that is. But when this setting is set to now, there is no real way to switch to vertical because when you flip the screen to go to vertical, it just powers off. So what you'll wanna do if you are wanting to shoot in vertical mode is to actually change that setting to be maybe two seconds. And this way when you flip the screen, you can hit continue and it will switch into a vertical shooting mode. And if you flip back, it will go back into landscape. So I would recommend probably leaving that setting on two seconds. Next up, we have the slider control. This is where you can have it set to zoom or gimbal. You have the option to choose how you want this icon to be set up when you press it. And that is where you can change it. You have those two options, zoom or gimbal. Next up is selfie flip. I would highly recommend leaving that off. So when I first got this camera, I thought, yeah, let's engage selfie mode. Thinking that when I would flip the camera around, I'd be able to you know, see myself flipped in the monitor. But the reality is the camera already does that even when this is off. When this is on, it's going to record your video flipped, mirrored. 
And that's really bad because there's going to be times where like if you're wearing a hat or a shirt that says something, the words will be backwards. It'll be really obvious that something's off. Um, and personally, it's just not right in my opinion. So I would just turn that off. There's pretty much no situation where you would need it. Even when it's off, the monitor will still flip for you. Next, we have a newer setting that has been included in the most recent firmware update, which is this built-in mic audio backup. This can be pretty handy. So if you have a transmitter connected, you can actually turn this on and you'll be able to get a separate backup recording that is going to house the actual mic audio from the DJI Osmo, which means you can get you know a more immersive sound. You can have an extra backup. A lot of great things come from this. So I would turn that on. A really great use of the built-in mic backup could be, you know, if you are with somebody and you want to give them the transmitter while you're holding the camera, then you could be picking up audio from the transmitter and from the camera separately, which is a nice little way to use that. Next up is the OTG connection. This is really going to be useful if you have an Android device, which I do not have, but if you need to connect it and do some data transfer and things, this is where you'll do it with an Android device. Next up is some information on your wireless connection. Uh, you can change your Wi-Fi frequency um, and you can reset the connection. Next up is wearable mode. So if you're going to be mounting this uh, maybe to like a chest mount or a backpack and you wanna get it's kind of like a POV style view, you can turn this on and it will lock the gimbal in place in a way that's going to be, you know, for a POV mountable style shot where you have a little bit of control with the screen still. Uh, but yeah, that's where you can engage that mode. Then we have gimbal calibration. This is where you can calibrate the gimbal if you feel like it's just not doing exactly what it should be doing. Maybe it needs to be recalibrated. Simply just set it on a flat surface, hit confirm, and it will run through a cycle where all of the motors and things will calibrate itself. Next up, we have the joystick speed. This is where you can choose how fast or slow you want the gimbal to respond to the joystick. Personally, I've found that zoom on four and gimbal on two has been a nice uh, pace for me, allowing me to get some more cinematic shots. Now, if I was going to be doing you know a faster tracking situation, I may wanna turn this up a little faster. But as of now, that's the speed that I've personally been enjoying. Next up is video compression. Uh, this HEVC file format is going to be what you need to choose if you're going to be using the 4K 10-bit options. Um, if you want to go, you know, just more uh, compatible with a bunch of different devices and things, you can do H.264, but you will be limited, um, you know, to a smaller 8-bit style footage. Next up is sounds, and this is where you can just simply choose the level of the sounds, or if you want to turn it off altogether, you can turn off all those little beeping and sound indicators. I've just left mine on medium for now. But if I was going to be doing some sort of an event, I would probably turn this to mute. Then we have the reference line. This is gonna basically be your rule of thirds grid. This is what the screen looks like with no grids on, but I'll go back into the settings and find reference line, turn grid on, go back, and now we have this rule of thirds grid, which personally I love to have showing because it allows me to more easily compose my shots. Now you can also choose this other option, two, three, five, one, and you'll see these little lines up here, which are basically more like kind of where the cinematic bars would go. Uh, it's just a different framing ratio if you know you're going to be outputting that way. But for me, I don't really do that. So personally, I like to turn on just the grid. Next up is anti-flicker. So if you're shooting in a certain type of lighting environment, you may need to change this a little bit. Could change depending on you know which country you're in and, and things like that. But I would just leave it on auto. Next up is timecode, which has to do with syncing across multiple devices where they're all running timecode. And that's not something that I'm gonna get into in this video because it's not something I ever mess with, but here is where you could mess with it. You can do the system time, a time code display, and you can reset the time code. Next up is naming management. So this is where you can get a little bit customized on how you want your files to be named. You can change the folder name uh, and the file name. 
So right now I have it just set to the default because I've been fine with that. But if you want to customize it, this is where you can do it. Um, then on this next setting, you can do screen off when recording. So maybe you're going to be recording something for a really long period of time where you're just kind of setting it up and forgetting it. You're not really going to be monitoring it. Um, so it would help save power. So you could choose if you want that to happen. But personally, I leave it on never because I always want my screen to be on when I'm recording. Next is auto power off. So you can just simply choose how long you want the camera to stay on and dormant before it turns off. Next up is the LED indicators. Uh, I personally like to have those on. There's a couple lights around the device that just display some different things. But if you are in a, you know, maybe really dark situation or you find it just distracting, you can easily turn that off by toggling this little switch here. Next has to do with live streams, which I'll cover a little bit later in the app section of this video. Then we've got our language, which is simply set to English. If you need to change it, you can do it there. Then we've got a format, which we can just simply swipe to format the SD card. Then there's a factory reset, some device information, and some compliance information. This next icon is a lot simpler. This is just going to give you some control over what the screen is doing when it rotates certain ways. So when we have it on landscape, no matter if I have the screen on landscape or vertical, the image itself will still be recording in landscape. So you can see it's still landscape. This could be handy if you want to be able to collapse the screen like this to maybe hold it a little easier, but still record in landscape or things like that. If we toggle it to portrait, now, no matter what, it's going to be set in portrait mode. So even if we're landscape screen, the recording will be in portrait mode. And next is going to be auto rotation. So now when the screen is sideways, it will be in landscape. And when we switch it to vertical, it will shoot vertical. This is how I personally like to leave it. This next little section will be about your gimbal speed. So you've got uh, slow, default, and fast. And it gives you a little bit of information about you know, what this means. So on slow, the gimbal moves slowly to take smoother videos. Default, it's going to be a moderate speed, which is suitable for most scenarios. And then we've got fast, which is where the gimbal will move abruptly and uh, create a screen shake effect, which is suitable for capturing fast moving subjects. I would personally leave this on default for most of the time. And this last icon here is gimbal modes. There's a couple of gimbal modes that you have. There's follow, tilt locked, and FPV. I leave mine in follow mode for most scenarios. Uh, as it says right here, it's great for vlogs or selfie videos. Tilt lock, I've also used a few times. I think it's great for those push in and pull back style shots. It basically just keeps the horizon line level. You know, when you're in follow mode, it, it will move up and down and just really follow in whatever direction you angle the gimbal. But in tilt locked, it's gonna keep that horizon level, which is just gonna be a lot more useful for more cinematic slider type shots. And then you have FPV mode, which the camera will just rotate freely. It will kind of angle, if you angle it you know, side to side, kind of get more of a curvy look with the shots. But personally, I like follow mode. So if we swipe from the side here, we get a bunch more shooting controls. So right off the top, there's two icons here. There's a gear icon and a mic icon. So it's kind of like two pages of settings. Let's start with the gear icon. Right here, we have exposure controls. So if we tap this, we'll be able to see a lot of exposure information. Um, right here on the side is going to be your exposure compensation. So I personally like to leave mine on negative 0.3. I find it just helps retain a little bit of the highlights and looks really good without making things too dark. Then on this side, we have an ISO range. So if you know you wanna limit how high the ISO goes on the camera, you can do it here. Personally, I just turned it up all the way so that when I'm on auto, I can get it looking bright if I need to. Then if you select this little M right next to auto, you'll get into a manual control. So on the left side, we have shutter speed, and on the right side, we have ISO. 
So in this situation, you know, since I'm recording in, you know, 24 frames a second, I could switch to one over 50 and then I could do my ISO settings here all manual if I know I want to lock it in. Now, look, I get it. Some of you may be thinking, why would I ever want to switch my camera away from auto? Well, the reality is sometimes the camera just doesn't quite get it right, or maybe it's just not quite getting the vision that you have. That's where manual comes in. But I know, I know, it can be super overwhelming, especially when you're starting out. Things like ISO, shutter speed, aperture, white balance, resolution, there's so many things to do. This is actually why I've created my free course, Super Simple Camera Settings. I've broken it all down and made it super simple to understand. All so that you can level up your content and go from auto to manual in minutes. You can check it out at supersimplecamerasettings.com. Right next to here, we have a white balance control. I have mine currently set to 5,600 Kelvin, which is the color of daylight. By default, yours is probably on auto white balance, but I personally like to be able to lock this in so that it's not changing while I'm recording. Next up, you can turn your glamour effects on and off. Um, personally, I would definitely recommend leaving this off. I made the mistake of some of my first initial tests when I was messing with this camera. I had the glamour effect on and didn't realize it. So I would definitely check that there. Now, if you do have it on, uh, one way you can see that it's on is there'll be this little face icon up here. So if I go over here and turn it off, that little face icon will no longer be there. Next up is color. So when we go into color, we have a couple options. So by default, you'll be on normal, which as it says is normal. Then you have HLG 10 bit and D log M 10 bit. So D log is going to be, you know, the profile that's going to retain the most dynamic range, uh, but it will require some color grading in post-production. Personally, this is what I like to leave it on for most of the time, pretty much a hundred percent of the time, because I like to have the flexibility in the edit to pull the most out of it and kind of color grade it in different ways after the fact. Then below this, we have focus mode. So you have single, continuous, or product showcase mode. So as it says over here, Single might be good if you're filming a motionless subject, but most of the time you or a subject will be moving. So I like to usually leave this in continuous, which is where it's going to be actively changing focus and prioritizing what's most predominant in the frame. And then we also have product showcase mode, which is where the gimbal is no longer going to prioritize a human face, but it's going to prioritize a product that you're holding if you choose to hold something up to the camera. This can be handy in certain situations, but most of the time I will leave this on continuous. And then we have some image adjustments. So by default, I do think that the camera does look a little bit too sharp. So personally, I turn my sharpness down to negative one and my noise reduction down to negative one. I just like the way that this looked the best. Um, but if you wanna make it a little bit, you know, less sharp or a little bit sharper, you have a little bit of control there. Personally, I'd recommend negative one, negative one. All right, moving right back up to the top over here, if we select this little mic icon, we get some controls over the camera audio. So we can choose if we wanna have a stereo channel, we can choose if we wanna have when noise reduction on or off, and we can choose which direction we want the built-in camera microphones to be picking up. So if we go into stereo, we can simply tap that to change it between mono and stereo noise reduction we simply tap to change it on and off and then directional audio so when we choose front audio will only be getting picked up from the front mic if we choose front and back it will be doing both and if we choose all then it will be more of an omnidirectional pickup pattern now i would typically just leave this on all but that's also because most of the time i'm going to be using a transmitter which i'll go ahead and turn on now and when I turn it on, these settings are going to change a little bit. So now you can see that instead of having a mic icon, I actually have the DJI transmitter icon and I have some different, you know, system settings. So I've got this transmitter one gain. So if I know I want to gain up the transmitter, I can quickly do it right there. Or I can mute the transmitter and as I mute it, it actually vibrates a little bit. So to indicate to me that it muted. Um, and that's because I have that setting turned on. 
Uh, and then we have transmitter one noise reduction, which you can simply turn on and that will just you know, bring in a little bit of noise reduction. Personally, I would leave this on zero off and off uh, just because again, I like to have more control over my noise reduction and things like that in post-production myself. And the last setting to mention over here is gonna be swiping from the other side. And this is going to show you footage that you have recorded. You can hit this little grid icon and see different clips that you've recorded. You can select different clips. If you know you want to delete them, you can do that simply by deleting, or you can also favorite some footage as well. Uh, if there's shots you really like that you wanna quickly find, that's how you can do this. But again, if you wanna fully format the device, you can do that over here, down at the bottom. There's that little option to format, which will erase everything on the device. All right, let's take a look at a few of these modes. Let's select the modes icon and we'll choose slow motion. This is going to be one that you may wanna access more frequently. So when you're in slow motion mode, you can actually swipe up here to choose your resolution and your frame rate. If you choose something like 1080, you'll actually have higher frame rate options, but for the most part, probably 4K 120 will be what you'll wanna use here. Now with the latest update, you can actually capture 4K 120 in D-Log, which is pretty cool. Moving along into the hyperlapse mode, this is where you can do different time lapses and motion lapses. Simply swipe up here and you'll see, you can choose your type of time lapse. You've got hyperlapse, time lapse, and motion lapse. In hyperlapse, you can choose you know different rates that you want the hyperlapse to occur. I like leaving this on auto personally. I think it works pretty well. In time lapse, you can choose what type of you know scene you're doing a time lapse of, or you can do custom and it says swipe up to set parameters so we can swipe up. And this is where you can change the intervals and video duration. For example, if we record at a three second interval for 30 minutes, we'll get about 20 seconds of footage. Going back into the settings, we can also go to motion lapse. This is where you can create basically a motorized time lapse. You can go left to right, right to left, or do custom motion where you can swipe up to set parameters again. But when we go back to here, we can actually move around and set our waypoints. So say we want to, you know, maybe instead of going left to right, maybe we want to start up high. Then we can just kind of like angle. Maybe we want to just get this plant right here. And then we can go ahead and move down and set another point. And we can hit play. This will kind of show the motion that we're going to do. And once we like the motion, we can hit record and those interval settings we chose earlier will kick in. To clear out your waypoints, you can simply hit the X here. To change how many waypoints you have, simply select this top left icon and you can enter the amount you want. And to change out of this mode, you can go back to the mode icon here. So now we've got low light. When we are in low light, basically the camera is going to choose a lot of stuff for us. So we don't have as much control over certain things here. We don't have picture profiles we can't capture in D-Log, uh, but the camera is going to try to optimize itself for better low light performance. Uh, personally, I kind of like just recording in D-Log and color grading it later. I think it looks just as good, if not better, most of the time. Then we've got our normal video mode, which we've already looked at. And then we've got photo mode. So inside of photo mode, this you can simply take pictures. If you hit the record button, it's just gonna snap a shot. Even though there's no video resolution or frame rate options here, you can still swipe up. You can choose your aspect ratio. And also if you wanna have like a little bit of a timer before you do your photo, for example, three seconds, click the button and it will snap a photo for you. And moving one over, we have Panorama. This one's pretty cool. If you swipe up, you have a few options. You can do 180 degrees or do a three by three option. When it does 180 degrees, it will essentially create a really wide panorama. And you can still choose if you wanna have a countdown. If say you wanna do like something like five seconds and then hop in, you can do that. But for now, let's just see what panorama does. I'll go ahead and leave it on 180. And when I take the picture, 
the gimbal is actually going to be moving and taking a series of pictures and then stitching it together to create one longer picture. And if I check out my images over here, I can see I have a long panoramic image. But if I change this to three by three and do the same thing, it's actually gonna take nine photos. So I'm gonna keep the device upright like it says, and it's gonna take a series of these nine images to essentially create one really large file. Uh, that's a nice square image with a lot of resolution. And you can see it's kind of loading, processing all of that stuff right now. And if I swipe over to the side, I can see this really warpy, big, long, you know, not long, but big square image. And that about does it for most of the modes because then we move into custom modes, which is where you can save different options to quickly get to them. So in custom one, I have 4K 24. So this is a regular speed frame rate of 24 in 4K resolution. But if I wanna quickly go to 60, I can just switch my custom mode and I've pre-saved this to 4K 60. Same if I wanna to get to slow motion in 4K 120. I can save all of that ahead of time and quickly switch there. That way when I'm on the fly creating, I don't have to dabble with the menus as much because I've already done that ahead of time. So let me show you how to set this up. You'll start by selecting the mode that you want. For us right now, let's choose video. Once we're in video mode, we can change some of our settings. Let's go ahead and make this 30 frames a second and we'll change our color profile to normal. And say this is what we want our custom mode to be. We can simply swipe down and hit this first little person icon and we can choose one of these five settings to overwrite. So for now, let's go ahead and overwrite this last one right here, custom five. We'll confirm that. And now we can see we're in custom mode five. So let's change out of this. We'll go to custom mode one and we are at 4K24 in D-Log. But now if we switch to custom mode five, we're in 4K30 in normal because it's recalling what we just saved. So as you can see, this is really powerful. And the way I have mine set up that I personally like is I have 4K24 in custom mode one. I have 4K60 in custom mode two. I have 4K120 in custom mode three. I have a quick hyperlapse mode in case I wanna do that real fast. I've got that option right there. And then custom five, I still have open and I just changed it for this example. But overall, it's a really nice way to be able to quickly change your settings so that you can create fast. All right, let's talk about the app. To connect your device, simply scan the QR code and follow the prompts to download the DJI MIMO app. You'll have to follow a few prompts within the app and then you'll be connected. Once the device has been connected, you can open up the app and this is the home page that you're greeted with. To actually get access into the device to control it, click this little icon that says device. Let's break down all of these controls. Starting here at the top, we have these three little icons. If you click this, you'll see a couple of new settings. You'll actually get new icons up at the top. Start with this first one. These squares right here really have to do all about device settings. You've got device management, SD card capacity, you can format the SD card, change your video compression, look at your Wi-Fi, and a general about section. All of that is within this little tab. Then we have some gimbal settings. We can choose to turn on gimbal easy control. If we turn that off, you'll see that there is nothing over here. But if we go back and we turn it on, we'll have this little joystick option here, which is how we can easily move the gimbal around and control it. So if you want that easy little control, you can toggle that on. And if you don't want it, you can leave it off. For now, I'll leave it on. You can also calibrate the gimbal here as well. And this last little icon is for the pro shooting mode options. You've got a couple of settings here. You can uh, enable the pro mode. You can choose to turn your grid on and off. Now this won't affect what is happening on the actual Osmo. This grid is only gonna be happening on your phone here. You can change your focus mode, your white balance, and your color, 
Um, you can get into some audio options as well with the channels, as well as the wind noise reduction, your directions for your microphones, as well as this overexposure alert, which is simply like zebras. So if you start to have something that's overexposed within your frame, they will actually light up. Or you could turn on the histogram if you want to judge your exposure by that. Um, and then if you are doing time code, you have a time code display toggle here as well. Moving on to this next icon, this is going to be your glamour filters. And you actually have a few extra filters within the app. So you can do smooth skin, you can brighten, do slim, eyes, dark circles, nose, mouth, teeth, lipstick, blush, and brows. And you can choose to mess with all of those things and then you can toggle it on and off. I'd definitely be careful with this because it can get looking pretty weird pretty fast. Personally, I don't use it at all. Next up, we have our resolution and frame rate options that you can easily change. Next up, we have our exposure controls. So right now everything's set to auto, but if I change this to manual, uh, you'll see everything instantly changes and I can start dialing in some manual settings, uh, you know, if I want to start to do that. For now, I'll leave it on auto. Then we have this home icon, which is how we get back to the main section of the app. And again, we can hit device to go back into where we just were. Following along right over here, we have a couple of indicators. We've got Wi-Fi signal, battery life, and our SD card indicators that we can easily see. Then right below that, we can flip the camera around. So now you guys can see me and I'll flip it back. And it's as easy as that. Then right here, we have a couple of indicators as far as our exposure goes. Again, right now we're on auto, but it's just basically displaying what it's doing. Up here, we have that easy gimbal control. And then down here, this will actually recenter the gimbal. So if we're moved around over here and want to recenter it, just tap that and it will recenter it. Then on the other side, we have some gimbal controls. We can change the mode from default to follow. And right here we have our selfie flip option. And right here we have our playback, which is where we can pull up any of our media that is on the Osmo and we can look at it on the app. And then down on the bottom, we have our different modes. So we can do hyperlapse, time lapse, slow motion, low light, video photo, pano, and live stream. So one of the only newer features in these modes over here is live stream. And this is actually where you can set up to stream directly to Facebook, YouTube, or somewhere else using RTMP. And you can dial in your live stream settings and go live. Personally, I have not done this, but it's cool that you can. And the last thing I'll talk about is what happens when you plug this in via USB-C. You're going to get two options, file transfer and webcam. When you select file transfer, uh, the camera will basically be operating as an SD card and you'll be able to pull files on and off of it. But when you choose webcam, you'll get this little preparing webcam option and then you'll be able to use this as a webcam. It will just instantly register on your computer as a device that you can choose to uh, use as a camera. You do have a couple of options in regards to frame rate. If you swipe up, you've got 1080 at 25 slash 30 or 1080 at 50 slash 60. I would probably recommend using 1080 at 30. You'll still be able to access a couple of features like face tracking so that the gimbal can follow you around while you are live streaming, which is pretty cool. Dialing in all of these settings is great, but what's even more important is how you are in front of the camera. And because of this, I've actually put together some tips to help you level up your camera confidence. You can check that out by continuing on to this video here. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay creative. Peace.